effective in blocking seizures and that there is strong support for further investigation into the utility of CBD in human epilepsy. The subsequent 1999 Institute of Medicine report was less enthusiastic, saying the solid scientific evidence still isn't there yet, and it was unlikely to be a fruitful area for drug research. Well, I'm not waiting for the FDA approval to come through. It is, I know how it affects my body, and that's one thing that I've learned through taking prescription drugs all these years. I have to know how this stuff is going to affect me, not what somebody else says it does for them. Not only has it completely stopped her seizures, but she says something in the plant works for her anxiety, depression, and insomnia, too. So she sees the scientifically undesirable cornucopia of substances in the plant as a benefit, not a detriment. The fact is it works. It works better than anything I've ever tried, any pill I've ever taken. But cannabinoids have multiple actions. It's not just for on pain or, in her case, maybe anti-epileptic action, but... For, for many people, they have a sedative and anti-anxiety effect and so forth. I'm a cancer doctor and I often suggest to my patients that they consider marijuana for their loss of appetite, nausea, pain, depression, and insomnia. It's one medicine they could use instead of five. Critics of medical marijuana are highly skeptical of claims it can treat just about everything. How is it possible that one plant has the potential to treat so many different ailments? Intriguing answers started appearing in the early 90s when researchers pinpointed receptors in the brain and the body that bind with the cannabinoids. Receptors can be described as locks on the surface of a cell, and when the correct key binds with the correct lock or receptor, it opens the door and delivers messages. Sometimes the message is that the body is feeling pain. Other times the message may be that there is an invader and the immune system must attack. Scientists located two receptors, uh, cannabinoid receptors, one called the CB1 receptor, mainly in the brain, and the other is the CB2 receptor, which is mainly in cells of the immune system. The CB1 receptors are extremely abundant in the brain, but they're also found all over the body in the major organs, the heart, the liver, kidneys, and pancreas. After finding all these locks that accepted the cannabis key, researchers made the next big discovery. The human body makes its own cannabinoids, called endocannabinoids. We have this whole elaborate system where we have these receptors in our brain and in our immune system and these circulating chemicals that we produce ourselves that really are very, very similar to the chemicals in the marijuana plant. The only difference is that the endocannabinoids that we produce are in such small quantities and they're also rapidly degraded so that therefore we are not high all the time or you know we don't have that feeling of euphoria all the time. Dr. But Prakash Nayagarkati is a professor of pathology and microbiology at the University of South Carolina. For the last decade he's been doing research on what's become known as the human endocannabinoid system. The precise functions of the endocannabinoid system is uh, it's still being uh, understood, actually. The discovery of the system, however, is already revealing clues that have bolstered the personal stories of relief. The areas of the brain that control nausea and vomiting, chronic pain, and epileptic seizures all have cannabinoid receptors. What do these things do? Well, um, in the brain and the nervous system, the cannabinoid system seems to uh, uh, exert kind of a, a dampening effect. It's kind of an internal, I think, I like to think of it as a neurological shock absorber. And when they looked in other animals, they found these receptors were present in basically all animal species. So why do dogs and monkeys, for example, need to have cannabinoid receptors? They must be playing a very critical role in trying to uh, maintain some of the physiological functions. The whole development of the fact that there are cannabinoid receptors in endocannabinoids has really given drug companies and pharmaceutical investigators a lot of opportunity to try to manipulate uh, the body's own cannabinoid system. That's because now they can create synthetic drugs that target the receptors instead of taking chemicals from the plant. By avoiding the plant, they get around the controversies and complications of its Schedule I status. 
A search of the U.S. patent database reveals numerous large pharmaceutical companies have filed recent patents claiming their cannabinoid receptor drug has the potential to treat almost everything. Multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, rheumatoid arthritis, Tourette's, epilepsy, heart disease, obesity, various mental illnesses, and the holy grail of medicine, a cancer cure. We feel that these cannabinoids give us an opportunity to study their functions, you know, and see how we can exploit them, how we can manipulate these cannabinoids and the receptors to find cures for a large number of diseases currently in which there is particularly no cure. As an immunologist, Dr. Niagara Cotty and his researchers at the University of South Carolina are exploring the impact cannabinoids and the CB2 receptors have on the human immune system. Both U.S. reports on marijuana found the cannabinoids do suppress the immune system, and previously this was seen as a concern. But Dr. Niagara Cotty believes tamping down the immune system could be a good thing. That are a is a concern, but Dr. Niagara Cotty believes tamping down the immune system could be a good thing. There are about 80 different autoimmune diseases, and basically autoimmune diseases are triggered by your immune system going haywire, getting hyperactivated and destroying certain cells and certain tissues. In multiple sclerosis, for example, the immune system suddenly begins attacking the brain and the spinal cord. Rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are similar diseases caused by the chronic inflammation associated with an immune system gone amok. The cannabinoids dampen down uh, response to um, uh, bacteria or foreign agents or uh, injury to tissues. A lot of scientists and researchers are interested in those properties of the cannabinoids in trying to see how we can suppress the immune response uh, in autoimmune disease uh, conditions. For Dr. Niagara Cotty, the research has gone far beyond treating inflammatory problems. He's narrowing in on the potential of cannabinoids to kill immune cells that have mutated and become cancerous. Once they become cancerous, they no longer die a normal cell death. Instead, they begin growing and spreading uncontrollably. We were one of the first labs to um, to demonstrate basically that not only the immune cells, the normal immune cells express these cannabinoid receptors called the CB2 receptors, but also that when these immune cells get transformed and they become cancer, to our surprise we found that these cancer cells continue to express these CB2 receptors. This was an exciting discovery because the CB2 receptor can act like a target for the cannabinoids. Once they bind with the receptor, they can tell the cancer cell to die. So basically telling the cells basically to commit suicide and that's what they do. And uh, we demonstrated that that would be the mechanism by which the cannabinoids can kill the cancer and therefore it can be used effectively as an anti-cancer agent. Dr. Niagara Cotty and his researchers were able to eradicate almost 100 percent of the cancer in test tubes, but they were skeptical they would see similar results when they moved on to tumors in mice. To our surprise we found that almost uh, 25 to 30 percent of the mice completely rejected the tumor. They were completely cured and uh, in addition we found that the remaining mice uh, also there was um, a significant reduction in the volume or the size of the tumors as well. The lab results have been so promising that Dr. Niagara Cotty is beginning clinical trials with leukemia patients. There is no doubt in his mind that the cannabinoids, either from the plant or lab created, will play a major role in medicine in the future. I feel that in the next five or ten years there, there is going to be exponential growth in cannabinoid research. It's an area where both the critics and the advocates agree. Scientists are now well on their way to developing medicines based on the cannabinoids. It begs the question, however, will modern medicine eventually make the marijuana plant obsolete? No, it will not. In fact, it will only enhance it. Okay, because now it's more proof that the plant really does work. Okay, and instead of spending $600 a month, on buying the pharmaceutical drug. I can grow my own plants. I don't want them to ever take the choice away because I don't know how long it's going to be before they really find out exactly what is working for me or for others. And right now having the raw plant available 
is the best solution because you have all of it there. You don't have just what they've isolated, just what they've decided is important now. Let's keep it in the corridors of science. Let's keep it in the FDA. Let's do what needs to be done, which is careful, longitudinal, placebo-controlled, crossover, head-to-head -head studies, and see where it falls out. But let's deliver what's really medicine. That is the individual cannabinoids. They may come across some things that are better than herbal marijuana for one thing or another, and good luck to them. I'd love that. But I never want to see compromised the capacity of people to use herbal marijuana, whether it's because the drug that they've come up with is much more expensive, or it doesn't do as well, or whatever the reason, that people should always have herbal marijuana available to them without any constraints from the law. Patients say for now the question is irrelevant. Science has not yet given them the opportunity to choose between an effective pill or the plant. This is something where I have no other medical alternative to treat this condition. I have exhausted all of modern medicine's alternatives and they have really screwed my body up. She says cannabis has allowed her to hold down two jobs and make plans to go back to school and finish those last credits. There is so much promise now where there was none before. Without the 10 to 12 cannabis cigarettes a day, I would not be working. I most likely would be on disability. I'd be homebound and I'd be a drain on society versus a productive member of society. The federal program that allows Irvin Rosenfeld to legally use marijuana for chronic pain was shut down in 1992. Today, he's one of a few living patients who were grandfathered in and still receive marijuana every month, courtesy of the U.S. taxpayer. Point Hatfield believes he will never gain back the muscle he lost during his cancer fight, but he got his life back, and he thinks people should not underestimate this plant just because it doesn't come with a prescription. It's medicine. It's medicine just like 